Uh, so I'm basically interested in knowing how uh, space and time influence the reception of the historical avant-garde outside of their countries of origin, and mainly in what people usually call peripheral countries or small countries like, like Finland, for instance. Uh, so I'm asking how the local circumstances affect the perception of what the different isms or avant-garde. Uh, how, for example, the chronological, chronological sequence of avant-garde is trans transformed in local perception, and how also the internal dynamics of uh, the movements and also internal dynamics is transformed in the perception in uh, peripheral countries, <coughs> small countries. I would like these uh, denominations, peripheral, small. That's how they are usually called. Uh, so I'm interested in how the avant-garde movements were appropriated. And in doing this kind of research, I've recently been interested in Reinhard Koselek's uh, writings on his uh, method of the Griffsche Geschichte. Uh, and I'm especially interested in knowing or asking uh, what kind of a horizon for potential experience and conceivable, conceivable theory, uh, concepts such as modernism, the general concept, or more specific ones like Dada as well as in, uh, in uh, for example, in the Finnish uh, context in the 1920s. Uh, in this research, I wish to take part in theoretical discussions uh, concerning, first of all, the problematization of the narratives of avant-garde, and especially I uh, would like to take part in the uh, criticism of, of Peter Burkes for the influence of theory of the avant-garde. Uh, this is a new discussion, it's been going on for some time now, and we know that uh, Burkes' uh, narrative of uh, Dada and avant-garde general is quite problematic. And what are the other options? That's the uh, question today. And uh, one of the ideas I've been juggling with or playing with is whether you could call actually the avant-garde thing in the late twenties, uh, whether you could call, you could call it a neo-avant-garde, following Paul Forster's description of neo-avant-garde. We heard earlier today a uh, very fortunate presentation on the main uh, on the main, uh, on the same period in Finnish literature, and he used the notion of post-avant-garde. So that's another option. It's, it's uh, interesting to compare this. Uh, different kind of ways of understanding the uh, situation. Uh, so, uh, instead of, of uh, discussing several countries, mainly in the Baltic Sea region, Sweden, Finland, Estonia, I'm going to uh, discuss only Finland in the 1920s today. But Finland in the 1920s is actually a quite complex case. First of all, because there are two literatures that exist in the same uh, geographical, political, and economic space. Uh, literature written in Finnish and literature written in Swedish. So it exists in the same space but in different kind of linguistic and, and cultural contexts. So it's a kind of complex situation already in Finland. Uh, 1920s is, is a complex case also in the sense that two kind of narratives uh, meet in the early 20s especially. First of all, there's the World War I and its narratives of end, an end of our culture, end of an art, end of a period, end of Western civilization. Oswald Spengler, for example, is very much read in Finland at the time. Now, this narrative of end, of an ending, uh, coincides in Finland with a narrative of birth, a birth of, uh, of, of beginning of an expansion. Finland became independent in 1917, and this marked the end of a long struggle for independence and a kind of project of uh, construction of Finnish culture. Uh, and in that sense, the uh, early 20s were in Finland a kind of constant as a beginning of something. On the one hand, as the end of a struggle for independence, and at the same time as the beginning of, of a real independent autonomous uh, Finland as country and as culture. This uh, positive narrative of a beginning was however problematized by, by the Civil War in 1917 and 1918 uh, in Finland, uh, which uh, revealed indirectly the uh, mythical dimension in the optimistic narratives of national unity. Uh, I will focus on, on three moments. Uh, I'm using uh, names or titles of, of journals as some kind of shorthands for, for these uh, uh, three moments or uh, three facets in the reception of avant-garde in Finland. The first one is uh, symbolized by the journal uh, Ultra that was uh, published in 1922. Eight issues came out, only eight issues. I'm calling this moment the Selective Modernism. And they have uh, the names of the main authors uh, writing in Ultra, Harker Olson, who was a critic, uh, mainly writing uh, theater also, and Elmer Dictonius, who was a poet and a critic. 
both, of them, both of them were bilingual, Finnish and Swedish, and the German itself was also bilingual. Uh, the second moment is uh, uh, symbolized by the review Tulen Kantat. Uh, Origin Tulen Kantat in Torch Carriers, as it is uh, usually translated, was an album gathering uh, poetry by young authors published in 1924. Then it became a journal a review from 1928 to 1930. And there was a second uh, phase of publication also in the 1930s with quite a different kind of agenda. Uh, this is what I call uh, Kumlaki modernism, whereas uh, the moment of the phase uh, symbolized by both was selective modernism. I'm going to explain these notions in more detail in a while. Uh, the most important author in this collective that moment is Olavi Pauline, who was also mentioned by my video earlier today. And the third moment of facet. Uh, well, first, perhaps, is uh, symbolized by the uh, uh, review of Klaus Ego, published in 1928-1929, four issues only. And um, what, is, uh, what you find in Klaus Ego is a different approach to, to, to the continent of avant-garde, and uh, mainly through a creation of data as a critique of the theological time conception of modernism. The two main authors uh, in this respect are Donald Jürgen and Henry Clara, who were both writing in, in Swedish. So you have first a bilingual uh, review, then a Finnish one, and then a Swedish-speaking one. And anyway, I'm just using these uh, German names more as a shorthand for or symbols for specific approaches to modernism and the other kind. Uh, if you first focus on, on the ultra, uh, this first phase, uh, we can see that the tension between the narratives of end, of a uh, period, of uh, Western civilization, and a beginning, a beginning of Finnish culture, of Finnish autonomy, autonomy. The tension between these uh, two narratives is registered in, uh, in several metaphors, expressing a moment of violent transition with an unknown result, with an unknown end result, uh, expressing the feeling of being at the threshold of a new period. We find uh, metaphors like a volcano in Rapson, for example, in this class period, or the metaphor of a um, drawn bow ready to cast an arrow. Uh, that's the moment we are living in uh, in these uh, writings. All done in Rapson or a drawn bow ready to cast an arrow. Uh, there's also uh, quite commonly what you can find is a judgment on the impossibility of writing like before. Uh, Hagar Olsen, for example, writes uh, that the ways of seeing and feeling have fundamentally changed. And therefore, something else has to be found. Uh, related to these uh, phenomena or perceptions is the opposition of Finland and the rest of Europe. Uh, there's a perception of Finland as a country that is lacking behind in the evolution, uh, where especially literature is without contact in modernity. Without contact, on the other hand, to the modern world, uh, symbolized by technology, machines, and, and so on. And on the other hand, also we got connect to modern forms of writing, to the modern movements in, in aesthetics and politics. Hagel Olsen again writes that the uh, aesthetic society of Finland is still standing hesitantly on the threshold of the 90s, that is, 1890s, in the, uh, at the beginning uh, of the 20s. Uh, the Finnish intellectuals and writers adopted the strategy of internalization in this context. Uh, uh, trying to renew, renew, renew Finnish literature uh, by uh, introducing the continental movements in Finland. And of course, the younger intellectuals and writers were also acquiring cultural capital in the Finnish literary field. Uh, what is interesting in this context is that the uh, continental isms uh, and movements in art or literature were not very highly valued, with the ex exception of expressionism and especially on German expressionism. There is a uh, German despise or lack of respect for formalism and the uh, very existence of different isms, both interpreted as a sign or symbol of a critical period in history and, nothing, and, and as nothing more fundamental. Uh, my first uh, citation comes from Hager Olsson, uh, well, supposedly Hagar Olsen, I haven't been able to check whether it is her, but I, I'm quite sure it is her actually. Uh, writing the first issue of Ultra in 1922, on page 16, writing this way. Uh, 
this kind of a uh, programmatic article in the first history of Ultra, defining what the journal is about, what they are looking for. Uh, she writes, uh, we don't recognize art movements. They are for those who have the strong to make themselves heard, while their words lack in the strength. They are for those who have gesticulated while their faces are dead. The many isms of today are in their fragmented multitude just a sign of the critical period we live in. They have to be surpassed. The voice of the new generation shouts its march forward. This daring undertaking is not so unheard of and untypical of our time as people like to pretend. The law of generations demands such strife. If you see the ideas of the fathers and the sons go hand in hand, then you know that there is something wrong with the youth that has aged too early. The new art we believe in and want to fight for is nothing else than a new spring of the old art. Quite a surprising statement by a young intellectual in the 1920s. Uh, what we find in uh, these situations are some fundamental underlying uh, conceptions and oppositions. Uh, first of all, uh, metatexts like manifestos are considered as secondary as compared to the true artworks. You find the opposition of uh, shouting versus inner strength of words, or between gestures and the face, where implicitly the manifestos, Pokemon writings on the avant garde, is compared to this. Uh, superficial shouting and uh, gesticulation. You find also uh, the opposition between formalism and uh, true emotions and experiences that were uh, expressed by expressionist poetry in Germany at the time. Uh, it is through this kind of oppositions that the Finnish intellectuals, symbolized here by Hagen Olsen, were trying to see what were the valuable elements in the continental avant garde and movements. And there's this uh, process of selecting the value elements and bringing those into the film. And this is what I call the selective modernism of the time. Selective modernism. On the one hand, if you look at the uh, temporalities involved in the situation, uh, what is interesting is that you find the universal generational opposition between the old and the young. Or opposition between the old and the young, which is considered as universal. On the other hand, you find a uh, cyclical development of the arts compared to natural cycles. Uh, the author speaks here about the new spring of the old art. So it's the idea of cyclical repetition of the same, fundamentally. But on the other hand, a slightly contradictory also, you find the idea of progress, the march forward. The voice of the new generation shouts its march forward, which is taken as a norm. It says at the end that uh, if the young generation doesn't revolt against the other one, then there's something wrong with the young generation. So on the one hand, the difference between generation and march forward is taken as a norm, but at the same time, there's underlying uh, presupposition of a cyclical uh, temporal process in arts and literature. Uh, something very complex. Um, in my opinion, uh, there's no point in trying to, how to say, clarify these convictions further. I think that's the characteristic of the times, of the attitude of Finnish writers and intellectuals. Related to these uh, convictions is also the defense of the divine between the high and the low in Finnish culture, which is visible in other writings in the same journal. For example, in the critical stance, the authors adopt towards cinema, which is considered as a secondary art, or, uh, art form, as kind of theater, for example. Uh, so that's a selective modernism, where the geographical distance between Finland and uh, mainland Europe and the fact that Finnish culture is lagging behind in evolution as compared to the uh, continental uh, uh, countries imposes a process of selection on Finnish intellectuals. They have to choose what kind of viable elements and valuable elements that can be then uh, uh, appropriated in Finland. So selective uh, uh, modernism uh, com, uh, that goes hand in hand with this geographical distance and idea of lacking behind. Well, uh, the bilingual uh, review ultra was a short lived ex exception in the Finnish uh, cultural life in the 1920s. The interwar period between the First World War and the Second World War was in Finland still marked by the political strife between the Finnish speaking uh, uh, Finns and the Swedish speaking Finns. Uh, well, if you know the history of Finland, Somebody 
you might know. Uh, uh, you know that uh, the Finnish speaking was the uh, uh, Finnish speaking uh, directors for the uh, ascending group. They were getting more and more power in the cultural life and the political life in Finland. Whereas the Swedish speaking Finns for the old cultural elite who were slowly uh, losing their crown in Finland. Uh, the young Finnish speaking intellectuals were late in the 20s loosely uh, organized around the review to land compare, towards the areas, which I mentioned in the slide before. Uh, their project was very much in line with the project of national modernization. Finland was kind of uh, was being modernized very strongly at the time. And one aspect of this modernization was the building of Finnish culture, of uh, modern Finnish culture. And the Finnish speaking intellectuals generally accepted this agenda. And for example, the writers in Tulekan that were very much defending the autonomy of art. They espoused this uh, modernistic idea of the autonomy of the arts and literature. Uh, at the same time, they shared the uh, uh, need to catch up with Europe. So the idea of being lacking behind in evolution is shared by the writers at the end of the twenties also. Uh, one part of this uh, uh, project of Tulekan and Finnish speaking cultures was the reorganization of cultural contacts with continental Europe. They want to have more direct contacts. Uh, contacts. They uh, thought that before uh, Finland had been in contact with Europe, but through the mediation of Sweden and of, through mediation of Swedish speaking cultural elite. So there was a need to uh, establish new kinds of contacts, which uh, created a new interest for Polish countries, especially for Estonia. And there was a effort to construct a position that would be at the same time national and cosmopolitan. They thought the national values were central. Uh, for the project, but at the same time, they felt there has to be some kind of cosmopolitanism also, and they want to create a position that wouldn't be contradictory in that respect, both national and cosmopolitan at the same time. The perception of the avant-garde avant is motivated by these positions and, and desires. Uh, on the one hand, what you find in toy content is the uh, uh, same kind of stance as in ultra, with no recognition for the value of business. It's then doomed as foreign for the individual Finns. There's one author who quite nicely compares Finns with the English and argues that uh, the isms are typical for German and French culture, and the Finns are individual, individuals, individualists like the Englishmen, and therefore we don't have the same kind of isms here. On the other hand, uh, there's the writer Oli Pavlan who uh, has some kind of mission of bringing the modern world into Finland and of uh, presenting uh, modern arts and literature and modern life in general to the Finnish public. And uh, he has uh, what I would call a retrospective appreciation of especially Futurism and Dada as part of his agenda. He considers them as necessary elements that had to be brought into Finland in some form. And uh, here we have my second citation, which is from Olavi Pavlan, his book Nykyaika uh, Etsimässä. It's a pun on uh, Proust's uh, Recherche de Temps Perdu. Uh, you can translate uh, that in uh, English, uh, looking for or in search of the modern times, or contemporary times. Uh, you see the phrase in Proust's uh, uh, in search of the times uh, lost or past. Uh, Recherche de Temps Perdu. Uh, the station goes like this. In order to understand what today and tomorrow have to say, you have to understand what yesterday had to say. Our criticism and art has remained completely foreign to yesterday. You have not yet had yesterday. Very well, let today be yesterday. Otherwise, there would be a gap in evolution, and this must not happen because time and progress don't recognize empty spaces. I don't want to call it futurism or brutism, for heaven's sake, but I demand that we make explicit what yesterday was and what it means for today. Because we are the futurists, constructivists, and simultaneists, priests, and, and other extreme phenomena inspired by Russian culture, it is not possible to understand the worth and legitimacy of the new contemporary artist vision of the world, of overarsen, I suppose that could mean surrealism actually, new objectivity, and new romanticism. So we find here a very clear uh, argument uh, stating that it is not possible to understand today we want yesterday and that Finland didn't actually experience yesterday when yesterday was today. So there's a you know, need to uh, rewind the clocks and take a step back in time. 
Uh, underlying here is the uh, typical modern understanding of time as a theological process, a theological concept of time, and a progress in arts, where each movement or ism is necessary for the following generations. And you find here also this uh, quasi scientific reference to theory of evolution. The evolution doesn't know gaps, and therefore, in film, also the arts have to evolve as in elsewhere without gaps. Maria Stavrinakia Monday, in her presentation, uh, talked about the actualization of the past as part of the uh, agenda of the avant garde. Uh, what we find in Finland, in, and in our travel and uh, citation here, is the idea of the actualization of the past and the recent past as an elementary uh, part of the cultural memory of a nation. Even though Finland did have a uh, direct first hand experience of the continental Islamists, it's important to uh, import them into Finland through this kind of uh, historical presentation. It is clear also here that uh, Babylon is not uh, trying to uh, say, uh, he's not pushing Finnish artists to write futurist or Buddhist arts or music or whatever, uh, literature, for heaven's sake. He's not looking for that. He doesn't want to call out futurism or Buddhism. But what is important is that Finnish authors and artists are conscious of what has happened in Finland, uh, in Europe recently. So this is what I would call a cumulative modernism in the sense that there's an idea of, of, of evolutive progress where each step is necessary for the following ones. No gaps, uh, gaps are not possible. And this is something that happens without uh, the desire to wipe out whatever came earlier that Bodeman has concerned us fundamental for literary modernism. Uh, there's no desire of weeping uh, away what came earlier, but more uh, the need and desire to incorporate what went on earlier into the uh, building of a national uh, modern culture. Understandably, Futurism and Dada didn't really uh, flourish in Finnish literature, written in Finnish. Uh, well, it is presented here by a problem something of the past, so it's understandable. Uh, young aspiring artists or writers didn't really feel that it's their uh, project to write Dadaism and Futurism. Interestingly, the development in the Finnish, uh, Swe uh, Finnish literature written in Swedish took a different path in late 1920s. Uh, the generation opposition between old and the young took a more radical turn in that uh, literature. The opposition that was loved all through the 20s was occasionally uh, deepened, uh, sometimes provocatively, by the members of the young generation. Uh, Some products called the young writers for uh, quite well received by the uh, establishment, by the old guard. They had access to leading journals and to publish their works through main publication houses. But uh, what we see uh, at the end of the 1920s, or starting from 1925 especially, is some kind of growing irritation from part of the old guard towards the young generation. Uh, and this uh, process crystallizes around the re reception of Dada in Finland. And there are interesting uh, cases where Dada somehow uh, emerges in this discussion and, in my reading, influences its appropriation by Kunaguri and Hedrick Paran starting later. Uh, there are two important occasions where Dada uh, surfaces in, uh, in writing, in public, public discussion. The first one is Hager Olsson's review of Gunnar Björling's uh, uh, one photo collection in 1925, where Hager Olsson uh, argues that part of Björling's writing is Dadaistic, and she considers this as a negative aspect in his writing. Uh, what is funny in the history is that Göring wasn't aware of the existence of Dada before that. The first time he heard about Dada was when his own poet was called as Dadaist Hager Olsson. The same year in 1925 came the uh, uh, Orke Eriksson case. Uh, it's a case where one of the uh, writers of the Orca, uh, Bertrand Klinkenberg, here on the right hand side in the picture, uh, published a mock modernist poetry collection with the pseudonym Orke Eriksson. And some of the young critics uh, uh, praised the collection, calling it as a very good uh, uh, collection of modernist poetry. And such later, uh, Kripenberg revealed his true identity. It was, of course, a very good joke on the young generation. 
Uh, in this caricature that appeared in the Sadiqah Journal of Garden in 1st of November 1925, we find the, uh, uh, some of the uh, authors and directors of the young generation first admiring the modernist collection by O.K. Erikson on the left-hand side, uh, slightly French is posted up, uh, in front of it, mm -hmm. and then we find the checking box who, uh, who pops out and, and so, so uh, how to say the uh, feeble position of the young uh, generation. What is interesting here is actually that the uh, text below says the new clothes of emperor, or Meta Krippenberg and the Dadaists. What is interesting here is that the younger generation uh, intellectuals were not considering themselves as Dadaists. They were more critical of Dadaism. Hagar Wilson, for example, was utterly critical of Dadaism. But here, this label is uh, glued on all of them. And this was one of the events that somehow uh, sharpened the opposition between the young and old generation. Uh, interestingly, in Kwasayko, this journal at the end of the 1920s, uh, Bruno Björling and uh, Henry Pohlmann appropriated Dadaism for their own purposes. While the other intellectuals, Harvey Olsen, for example, and Nick Clunius, were critical about Dada. Building and Henry Parman took the label and uh, appropriated it for their own uh, product project. With very uh, little information about Dadaism, what Dadaism actually was. Their first source of information was Rosenberg's Anaman Dada, and that was almost the only source of information about Dadaism for them. So what we see here is that the uh, Dadaism is appropriated by these three authors in a very individualistic way. For Henry Parkland, uh, being Dada meant uh, kind of, a, of saying yes to the only aspects of modernity. Uh, Henry Parkland was an, uh, an immigrant. His family has, had left Russia after the revolution, and the, his family language is for Russian and German. He learned Swedish in, in school. And he was, of course, making a connection between Dada as art movement and the word Dada, yes, in Russian. And France, uh, interpreting that connection as kind of uh, saying yes to all the aspects of modern life. And especially uh, for uh, uh, popular culture and costume culture of this time, moving beyond the division and divide between the high and low. Uh, Gerling, uh, I'm going to last some time here, but I will end soon. Uh, for Gerling, that meant uh, the possibility of. of uh, pursuing a philosophy of, um, of uncompromised individual liberty in his own writing. Uh, he was looking for, he had this uh, philosophical imperative of, of uh, pursuing liberty, uh, freedom, in all aspects of life, including uh, writing and arts, and also with the risk of, of uh, being ostracized by the society, as he was in other times. So he was engaged in a struggle with the prevailing uh, moral uh, conceptions. So Dada for him was not, first of all, an aesthetic movement or an artistic movement, it was more a practical philosophy of life. Life that was then reflected in his writing. For example, uh, in texts that didn't really pay attention to grammar, comic structures or sentence structures, but tried to fragment diamonds in order to give uh, expression to his uh, practical philosophy of life. What is interesting for our topic here in this conference, uh, time and temporality, is that we find here a uh, certain kind of a uh, conception of time or of the position of the writers in uh, modernization, in this theological time of modernity. And this position is uh, quite well expressed by, for example, in Henry Parham's uh, poem uh, from his own only uh, public sport collection during his lifetime, Ideal Gratization, be translated by the sale of ideals, August 1929. Where we can read, for example, this text. Uh, if we would go backwards like traps, wouldn't we have arrived as far as now? And even if the future would drop our bottoms and the past twist our noses, we like the traps shamelessly. Uh, what we find here is the idea of advancing backwards, now the traps are walking uh, backwards. And uh, obviously, if you compare this, by, uh, for example, with uh, Walter Benjamin's reading of the uh, 
Portland, Spain, and those novels as the ancient of history. Uh, what is interesting here is that for, for Bowman, uh, the Urukamaya poem is somehow still between two uh, problematic uh, times the past, which is uh, feasting the Gnosis, and the future, which is wrapping the, uh, the botanists. So both of these are seen as something negative, and present is where the uh, uh, lyrical eye is situated. However, moving forward for the uh, time of modern uh, The critics of time not out that uh, Berlin and Parliament were late Dadaists. They were mocked of being late in the Dadaism. But uh, it didn't really matter for their project. They were upgrading Dadaism as a practical philosophy of life and as an aesthetic program. And through the appropriation of Dadaism, they were actually uh, making an implicit criticism of the church and time of modernism. They didn't want to uh, affiliate themselves with any movement that would uh, have exposed the church and time concepts of modernity. And they more uh, saw Dadaism as some kind of position where uh, the present was the uh, most important moment in time and past or future didn't really have importance, although they were recognized as existing, like in this uh, poem here. So, uh, Dadaism, uh, creation of Dadaism meant on one hand this artistic freedom and philosophical program, but also a position outside of the theological uh, conception of time, typical modernism. Uh, so to conclude, uh, just a few remarks I will end shortly. Uh, what we have to understand here, uh, and what has general signification I think also, is that the appropriation of, of the contents of movements, of ex expressionism, uh, futurism and data, uh, was very much influenced by the local context, and by very specific events in local context. There was this general uh, agenda of building a famous culture, it was the narrative of beginning and building, that motivated all the power on this uh, kind of historical approach to uh, futurism and data, for example. And on the other hand, there were these individual uh, events, like the uh, guard uh, caricature, that in a certain way structured the literary field, uh, created new positions in, uh, among the opposition that existed already there. There was the opposition between the old guard and the young guard, but the use of Dadaism, the, uh, say, uh, uh, the use of Dadaism from the outside of the circus of the young critics, somehow divided the young guard in two opposing uh, camps. And this extreme position of Dadaism was then appropriated by uh, Gunnar Göring and Poirot for their own purposes. Uh, so in a sense, I would say that uh, it's a very complex story that definitely doesn't fit to the Berkeleyan understanding of, of avant-garde or Dadaism, but it's more like a, a story of grappling with the different valences of avant-garde, as John Hamby, P. E. Byrne, and Trita Pelsky have written in the recent uh, special issue of New Literary History, for example. And uh, when Hal first writes about the uh, Mia avant-garde as a uh, continual process of tension and redemption, a complex array of unexpected futures and reconstructed pasts, in sort of as a deferred action that throws over any simple scheme of before and after to cause an effect of original tradition, I think this could be also used to characterize how one can be thin and not in the 20s. But that somehow would make the very notion of the one got void of signification. So that's the kind of idea I'm juggling with, but I'm not sure there to defend that reading of the film someone has the one got about later in the 20s. So thank you.